Hello everyone, my name is Dr Sam Hurst and um, this is the 11th in our series of the October Gothics A Day Tempts the Vampires to Stay. Now as usual I'm going to be introducing a book, I'm going to be giving you some key plot points, telling you why I think it's important and also giving you some reading recommendations. Today is one of my favourite books of all time. I know I sort of said that yesterday, but this is where my journey with the Gothic begun, really, back when I was an undergrad and somebody recommended this to me and I have never looked back. It's from the later period of that early British Gothic. And so we are getting towards the end of our investigation of that period. It's from 1820 and it's written by Charles Maturin and is, of course, Melmoth the Wanderer. Now, today's video is going to be a little bit longer even than usual. Why? Because the plot of this book is so complex, it's really difficult to give a very brief summary of it. Melmoth the Wanderer functions something like a matryoshka or Russian nesting doll, where you have stories within stories within stories, each leading on to the other, with a key motif running through. The motif is the character of Melmoth the Wanderer, a shadowy, quasi-demonic figure who is offering a deal too terrible to be named to people in various degrees of extremity. Well, most of them are at the nth degree of extremity when he comes into their lives. The story starts with John Melmoth going to his ancestral home in Ireland because his uncle is dying. Um, and when he's there, he finds this portrait of his ancestor Melmoth, who should very much be dead at this point, but as we later learn, Melmoth had made a deal with the devil for 150 extra years. He also finds with the painting a journal, which is the story of a man called Stanton. Now, Stanton had met or seen Melmoth in Spain at a wedding, a wedding that ended in death and tragedy, all because of Melmoth. Now, Stanton becomes obsessed to the extent that he ends up in an insane asylum. And that is where Melmoth returns and offers him the unspeakable deal. Now, Stanton does refuse, but he obviously eventually gets free, free enough at least to leave the details of his story in this house. The second story also comes about while we are with John, because there's a shipwreck on the shore and a Spaniard manages to escape from the ship, comes to shore and tells his story, the Spaniard's tale. Now, the name of the character is Alonso Monsar, and he is um, a victim of the oppression of the Catholic Church in Spain. Um, he is suffering because of a crafty priest who convinced his parents that because he was conceived out of wedlock, then he must be dedicated to the, ch to the church to atone for their sins. He is not very willing to be dedicated to the church, although he is tricked into giving his vows. But he is the victim of various machinations and tortures to try and keep him in the church. He attempts to escape, but is brought back. He is subject to everything that the Catholic Church can throw at him. And in his worst moment, that's when Melmoth comes to him to try and offer him the deal. But he refuses. He eventually escapes and hides with some crypto Jews um, underneath the city of Madrid. And while he's there, he is copying out and reading other people's stories. And we get to the next story, the tale of the Indian. Now, this is a story of a girl called Imali who grew up alone on an island because she was shipwrecked there. Now, Melmoth meets her as she's growing up and keeps coming back. And she, rather inevitably, perhaps for the novel of this time, falls in love with him. His relationship with her is less clear. But when she's rescued, rescued and brought back to Spain, Catholicized and given a, a Spanish name, Isidora, he also returns with her and they do get married secretly, of course, married by a scary dead priest in the middle of the night. Um, she ends up in the Inquisition because of all of this. I won't quite tell you how that works out, but it does. And that's when he comes to her and he also offers her the deal. But it's something that we get the sense that he regrets at the end of the novel as he talks about her, the potential for her forgiveness. And there's also the sense that there there is this possibility of love for him. Um, he says that when he's with her, he can forget for a second that he is a Cain, a condemned wanderer. Of course, it's not really enough because he does lead her into this traumatic experience and he does still try and make the deal with her. 
The next story that we hear is a story that is told to her father, and it's the story of Guthman and Guthman's family. Now, Guthman was a wealthy Spanish merchant, a Catholic, whose sister married a poor German Protestant. Now, there was a rift between them, but as the merchant is dying, he invites that family back to come stay with him, and he promises that they will get the inheritance. But at the last minute, a crafty priest, another one, gets him to give the money to the Catholic Church. They are led into increasing financial distress, um, leading to the son of the family, for example, selling his own blood for profit, and the daughter going out thinking about um, becoming a prostitute. The father is driven to such desperation that he's on the point of killing his entire family. Of course, that's when Melmoth is offering his deal, as usual. It all ends up well, though, because there is a good Catholic priest, or a good Catholic, who comes and has sorted out the inheritance problem, meaning that they do get the money in the end. The final story is that of the lover's tale, and it's my favourite, although no one else seems to really like it. It's the story of Margaret, Eleanor and John, three cousins, none of whom are brother and sister. And they um, are involved to some extent in a love triangle, although it's never quite a triangle. Eleanor and John are in love with each other, but Eleanor's the poor one. And so John's mother intervenes, telling John a lie, telling him that Eleanor is in fact his half sister. So he ends up marrying Margaret, It's all going very well until she dies in childbirth. That's the exact moment that John's mother decides, I'm going to tell him the truth. And he goes mad and never returns properly to consciousness or or to being able to understand the world and interact with it. He's looked after until his death by Eleanor, however. And of course, she is the victim that Melmoth attempts to prey on, but she too stands firm. As we reach the end of the lover's story, we start to come back out of all the stories that we've gone through. And we end once again with John and Monsada in the house in Ireland. And Melmoth himself enters the scene. Because his time is up, his 150 years is up, and he's just waiting for the devil to claim the soul that he made a deal to give away. Because, of course, that was the unspeakable deal that was being talked about all the time. It's an interesting ending, very mysterious. Neither John nor Monsada know what happens. We just see these drag marks leading to the edge of a cliff. So who knows? Now, this book is interesting um, for a number of different reasons, and I can give you just a couple of them. It's a really good example of the Irish Gothic for a start. And it's also interesting because of when it was written in the 1820s, when really the Gothic was going into decline. But this book had that sort of popular appeal that had a little bit of a resurgence. For me, what's always been interesting about this book is the treatment of religion. Because it's often seen as a highly anti-Catholic book. But it's a book that allows us to challenge a quite simplistic idea of anti-Catholicism. I always recommend reading this in accordance with um, Maturin's sermons, because he was a clergyman in the Church of Ireland, which is in communion with the Anglican Church in England, the Church of England. And in his sermons, he always makes sure to denounce the Catholic Church, but to differentiate between institution and individual saying that Catholics themselves, of course, could be saved. And I think that sort of nuance to his anti-Catholicism, his declamation of the state religion and of the church, compared to his more tolerant view of people confessing other faiths, is really key to understanding what's going on in Melmoth the Wanderer. Because, of course, we have these classic anti-Catholic tropes going on, with the machinations of the Catholic Church against Monsada. But we also have the good bishop who saves Monsada. And the same in the Guthman story. We have these machinations, but we have the good Catholic who helps them, who saves them, essentially. Also interesting in Charles Maturin's work is it dissolves this idea that we have, often when we're talking about the Gothic, of like a very simplistic Catholic versus Protestant, because... Maturin deliberately depicts a number of different Protestant denominations as well. Eleanor, for example, is a Catholic, uh, not a Catholic, a Quaker, very much not a Catholic. And the, um, the Warburg family are arguably Lutherans. Other characters are very clearly Calvinists. So there's a really, re- a really big mix of different religious denominations being depicted in the text. 
And what's interesting, of course, is that each and every one of them refuses to give up their soul in the deal that uh, Melmoth is trying to make. And that's part of the point of the whole novel. That's what Maturin tells us. He says the idea came to him when he was doing a sermon and he was saying to his congregation, nobody would give up their soul. And so here in fictional form, he's proving it. But that nobody doesn't just include people of the true faith or the proper faith. It includes people from all different denominations. And if they had already lost their salvation by wrong confession, would it really matter that much whether they refused to give it up or not? I don't think so. I think we can read this text as an interesting interrogation of the interplay between anti-Catholicism and toleration. And I would recommend doing so. Um, particularly recommend reading Maturin's sermons. But for some other reading recommendations, I would point you towards Maturin's other works. He's fascinating as a writer who is often engaging with Irish history. And so I would recommend the Mal Malaysian chief um, in that regard. Also, if you're interested in seeing more or investigating more about his interactions with religion and particularly with discourses of toleration, I recommend the Albigensian. So, I hope that you enjoyed this talk. I'm sorry it was so long, but I hope it was worth it. And I will see you tomorrow.